How you doing? Today we're going to be speaking with Marcus Rogers, and we're going to be talking about his book, but we're really going to be talking about business from the perspective of law of assumption and law of attraction. Marcus and I met about a couple of years ago. He reached out to me, and he was inquiring about a coaching session, and I gave him the price of that session, and I didn't hear back from him, so I thought I scared him off. And about a year later, he reached back out to me, and we started talking. At that point, we did our sessions and so forth. And he told me that he was doing this wonderful book. And so I've kind of followed him on this journey with this book. But Marcus has incorporated the law of assumptions really in a lot of the aspects of the businesses that he does. And he's been a fascinating young man. And so I really want to speak with him, get him uh, on the show and let you guys know that you can also incorporate the law of assumption, law of attraction in every aspect of your business. How you doing, Marcus? Doing pretty great. Thank you for having me. Appreciate cool. it. Thanks for being on. Thanks for being on. Now, of course, you got a book out there, and we'll talk about that. I'm curious about the title. It's amazing. Even a fifth grader can learn how to invest real estate. Now, what does that mean? I, I mean, where did you come up with that? Well, I um, I think a lot of people, when they hear real estate or any type of Anything that has to do with real estate, I think a lot of people are hesitant or apprehensive joining real estate because a lot of people, well, most people that I've seen on TV or anybody that they meet a person, I think a lot of people make it sound complicated. And I think if you can simplify it, it can open more doors. It, 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 it doesn't let people be discouraged, you know, go, going into real estate. So I felt like, so that being said, there was a game called the, uh, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And everybody who was older than the fifth grader was like, oh, man, you know what? I could definitely be the fifth grader. And then come to find out, yes, it's simple, but at the same time, it does complicate things as well. So I came with that same concept with this book because, yes, real estate, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be very complicated. But once you simplify it, it can make anybody feel comfortable I want to learn more so they can get their foot in the door. Okay. okay. So how do you, speaking of real estate, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, when you're talking about making money at the top five tiers, one of the things that people talk about is real estate investment. How do you incorporate something like the law of assumption in something as complicated or seemingly as complicated as real estate investment? It's a great question. So before I wrote this book, let me say about, Five years ago, I got into real estate. And this was before I knew about Neville or anything like that. And I was able to get my first property with no money and no credit. But, th but within a year, I lost it. And throughout that journey, in hindsight, I realized that within myself, I didn't, I couldn't see myself holding a property. I thought it was, I thought I was too good to have it. So because of that reason, I lost it. Fast forward years later, I heard an audio about Neville mm -hmm. and about law of assumption and depending on how you use your words, it could come into your, your reality, you could bring it to fruition. So I started using the techniques and the practices that Neville talked about in his audios and I started really imagining myself being the person to acquire that property. And lo and behold, the more I imagined, the more steps I took, and it literally became my reality. And from that point on, I never looked back and I used those those techniques or those methods to acquire every, pro every property that um, I attain. You said something, and I want to go back to it because I think a lot of people miss it. You said when you obtained your first property, you said that, you know, you didn't feel worthy, in essence, to have that property. And, of course, you lost it. So it kind of goes back to what Neville talks about. Feeling truly is the secret. Is that correct? A hundred percent. It was amazing because when I first got the property years ago, I was excited. Everything was flowing. But the challenge, the more challenging I got, I started questioning myself, doubting. And those thoughts do come up. Yeah. But I think the most important thing is to really stay in that zone to really believe that this is your property. Mm -hmm. or this is you belong here mm -hmm. and I lost confidence and then when I lost the property I started blaming everybody 
he did this, he did that. And when I took the time to really reflect, it was really because of me. Okay. And everything. So when it happened, I learned, learned from Neville that when I lost the property, that was secondary. But what really caused it was really how I felt inside. Yeah. And I lost the property. You, uh, we've had several conversations, so I know this now. This book is not just a title. I know that you speak with young people, and Scripture says that unless we become as little children, we should no wise and enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. You and I have had a conversation. You said, listen, sometimes children often, let me go and correct myself, often yeah. children pick up the things about real estate easier than adults. Tell us about that. 100%. Um, so when I first got into real estate, I thought I knew everything. I knew everything, ego through the roof. And then after I lost that property, I had to get myself back up and I got back into it. Mm -hmm. So start, So when I started acquiring more properties using the methods that I learned from Neville, I wanted to go back and do public speaking events and teach the kids or the youth what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to teach these youngsters. You know, I know everything. And come to find out, the more I started to teach, the more I started to learn even more for two reasons, because when you, when you teach, you learn more, but at the same time, the youth, the youth learns how to simplify it mm -hmm. and learn it at their level. And then replay it back to me. And I catch a whiff like, Whoa, I ain't see it like that. So kids is, I think it's an amazing thing to, to teach kids because the youth, they always have a childlike spirit. They always wanted to know more. They always have fun, you know, learning things. So it reflected, it rubbed off on me, and I learned more, and they're learning, so it's an even exchange. That's amazing. I remember uh, years ago, I used to go into um, schools and teach children about finances, you know, balancing the checkbook, because, of course, that wasn't something that was being taught. And it's amazing, like you said, the stuff that I learned in expounding what I thought I knew to these young <laughs> folks, all of a sudden they were teaching me some stuff and I took a different mindset away. So it goes back to what we're talking about, you know, unless you become a little child. And that's especially relevant when we're talking about the principles of Neville, because a lot of times I took my religious hat in with mm -hmm. Neville. You know, I, I took what I knew. I knew all this stuff. I just applied my spiritual principles to Neville and I'll be on my way. And I found that when I went in knowing nothing and becoming childlike and just being open to the principles and practicing the principles of Neville, then all of a sudden the whole world opened up to me. But to be honest with you, I'm going to ask the question. When I first started learning the principles of Neville, they threw me off. Reason being wasn't because they threw off what I had been taught by way of religion. Did you find that to be your experience as well, or was it that you didn't have a problem with the transition? I didn't have a problem with the transition because my father, he wasn't big on the traditional religion route. Gotcha. So he was more on the, uh, you know, like Marcus, your God. Gotcha. But I never, I never understood it. <laughs> and the more he started to repeat it, I still didn't understand it in its totality. So, yes, I heard about the law of attraction and things of that, but it's something with Neville. I, I can't put my finger on it, but when he said it, my soul started to, like, resonate. It wasn't even a doubt. I knew he was speaking the truth. I just couldn't explain it. So the teaching from my father, and then when Neville was speaking, it just coincided, and it just made sense. So it wasn't a difficult transition for me like that. It's wonderful. You're probably, and there's probably certainly other parents doing it, that was, especially in our community, that was unheard of. You know, like I said, even now, if I put a video out there and I tell the community, whether it be through Neville or Reverend Ike or some other teacher, and I communicate that they're gods, you know, I get from the religious community, satanic, <laughs> blasphemy, you know. Blasphemy. Everybody, yeah, everybody's <laughs> casting stones and everything like that, uh, verbal yeah. stones. And so I'm 
pleased to hear that there was somebody teaching their child early on, even though you didn't understand it. And that's how we come even when we, no matter what our religious experience is with Neville, even though we may not understand it early on, but when we start implementing and practicing, we become to we come to the realization of our true identity. And like you, I agree, there was something in Neville's message when I heard it, it resonated with me. When I I listened to it five years earlier, and then I kind of set it to the side and I started going back to other teachers, and then I came back. And at that point, it really resonated with me. But early on, when I first heard it, I wasn't at a place to receive it. And so, like I said, it's great to hear that there are people being taught early on that they are creators. And let's clear up, you know, because I know that there are those people who say that we're gods. We don't mean that we're solely gods apart from the deity known as God. But because of the deity known as God, we realize that we've been created in his, her, its image and likeness. And therefore, we're God's offspring. So, and again, I can't speak for your father, but I know that that's kind of where Neville's coming from, is that we're connected with the source. In him, we live, we move, we have our existence. So you started doing real estate. And like I said, <laughs> I talked about when we first started talking, uh, Marcus had reached out to me and we were talk. Funny thing is when we first spoke, we really connected early on. Mm -hmm. And it was like 18 months later that we finally spoke. Mm -hmm. What was that transition for you when you started using the Neville principles in your business? Did you notice a noticeable difference immediately, or was it something that kind of fostered over time? It's a great question. The first time that I started to see, so I wanted to test this on a mag on a, on a big scale. Okay, right. Sorry. Because I was so excited, I'm like, there's no way. Because when, when when Neville talks, it's something you it's it's the, the conviction. Yeah. It resonates with your soul. Yeah. And when when Neville said, you know, you could dream of whatsoever, that means I don't think people realize like whatsoever is whatsoever. Like it's really anything that you can think of. I think, you know, I, I tell that to people sometimes, but I don't think they get it. But Long story short, I said, you know what? I want a, I want a big apartment building. Mm -hmm. I had no money. Mm -hmm. And again, no credit. Gotcha. And I'm going to say for about a week straight, me being excited, I go to bed, literally imagining myself getting the color of the building, going at closing, shaking hands. And I did about a, about a week. Okay. And then things started to unfold along the way. And while things were unfolding along the way, I was able to get a small property with no money and no credit. Then I was able to get a bigger property with no money and no credit. But the when I first the first property that I got with no money and no credit, which was a small property, I believed it. But for some reason, we complicate things. I'm like, mm, that house is too small. That's not it. For some reason, like I just downplayed it. So I see. So I was like, you know what? Let me go for a bigger building. Okay. And don't get me wrong. A lot of bridges of incidences took place, and everything started to come into fruition. And when I, it's interesting because everything that I pursued, I had no money. That because people think that. It takes money to make money. That's not entirely true. Yeah. And so when I started to pursue one of the apartment builders that I have in our PA, once I closed, then I knew that this is real. Yeah. Now, along the way, I saw many signs of evidence that it was taking place. But I don't know. I think humans or probably myself just make it so complicated. I'm like, oh, that's not enough. I need to see something bigger. Yeah. And that was the, the, the tipping point when I finally closed. I said, this is real. And then from there, I always use that method to uh, acquire properties or acquire any goal. Sometimes I do fall off because it becomes too easy. Yeah. It becomes too simple. 
and the mind, the reason in mind makes you feel like, oh, this is too easy. You have to complicate it. So even though I did acquire properties uh, via this technique, I also failed many times mm -hmm. along the way because it, it became too easy. Yeah. So sometimes I fall and I have to get back up. So it's an ongoing learning process. I'm glad that you said that because when we're talking about the law of assumption, law of attraction, nobody, very few, talk about the failures or the setbacks. And the wonderful thing is that we have a history of Neville's talks. I mean, we have almost a 30-year period of Neville, you know, when he spoke with a small audience of six people mm -hmm. till he was to his death, literally. And so you see, everybody don't see what you're seeing in the talks, but we see Neville experiencing tragedy. We see him experiencing setbacks. Now, he never got on stage and just kind of outright talked about him, but we knew that his wife was ill. We knew that he had lost a nephew. He had lost siblings. He lost his secretary. So we know the man had experienced tragedy, but a lot of times when we get people in these communities and they're talking about manifestation, uh, law of assumption, we're given the impression that once you learn these principles, that everything is butterflies <laughs> and rainbows, as it were. So I'm glad that you're talking about, you know, I had both success and failures, but the failures were because I stepped away from what it is that I know to do. So what would you say to the listener? Now, you you talked about that large uh, property that you purchased. Once you purchase that large property, was there a change or a shift in your paradigm of, you said that all of a sudden I knew this stuff worked, but did Marcus become someone else? When you say become someone else. I can uh, let me expound yeah. on that. Neville talked he talked about his story. There was a black man who was also in real estate. Mm -hmm. And he had received a call from a white man that didn't realize he was a black man. And when they met, the man had brought several properties from him. But that only happened, the man was struggling financially prior to meeting Neville. He went to a Neville talk, took his wife to a Neville talk. They went to several talks. And all of a sudden, over a couple of years span, he became very prosperous. Matter of fact, he was worth well over a quarter of a million dollars at that time, which was a lot of money. And people said that the man had to have money before he started making these investments. And so he and Neville had a talk thereafter. And the guy said he had no money and he told the backstory. So when I say that Marcus changed, I don't mean, oh, did he get cocky or anything? But was there a shift in paradigm that says, oh, money comes to me easily and effortlessly now? Prior to that, I believe that money was a struggle. That's the shift that I'm speaking of. Yeah, the, the shift happened when it's like you have to be. So, all right, so you have to be the person that you desire to be. And what I mean by that is, so for example, a lot of people think that they have to have it to be it. Correct. And it's actually backwards. And actually, if you have it before you be it, you'll have it, but in a short period of time, you'll lose it. Yeah. So the shift, the, the shift came to me when I was enveloped in becoming the real estate investor. And money wasn't uh, much of a struggle mm -hmm. to acquire. So the shift came where I just became more attracting in, in the sense of like more deals started flowing to me, more people started to reach out to me, and more people believed that I was that. Mm -hmm. If I explained it correctly. I Listen, I know exactly I know exactly what you say, and I, I'm glad that we're having this conversation because the truth of the matter is many, many people within the community 
yeah. have a challenge with this. Neville talks about it. You know, Dr. Joseph Murphy talks about it. We're talking about it now. Uh, 2020 talks about it. We keep making this becoming, and you talk uh, in your book about be, do, have, opposed to have, do, be. And you even expound early on about when you were when you weren't in a state of being, you lost the property. Yeah. <laughs> when you begun to understand, this is who I am, I'm prosperous. At this moment, we both believe something about ourselves. Everybody that's listening to this talk at the moment believe something about themselves. That's what we're being at the moment. What most people fail to recognize, though, is that we're spiritual beings. Being spiritual beings, we can clothe ourselves in yeah. any state of being. So right now, Marcus has clothed himself in, and I know he's clothed himself in many states, but we're just talking about the real estate investment portion right. of him now. He's clothed himself in the state of, I'm a real estate investor. It's like a seaman on the ship or me being in the Marine Corps. There was never a doubt once I was sworn in to be a Marine that I was a Marine. I didn't wake up one day and say, am I a Marine or do I just feel like I'm a Marine? You don't wake up in the morning and say, am I really a real, a real estate investor? It's not even a thought. You know right. that you are. Right. And this is what we're trying to get people to grasp. We keep making the... Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that we make Neville too magical. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. by that? I think yeah. a lot of people in the community, we make Neville so, we make the principle so magical, mystical, and we don't realize how practical your father did. He said, you're God early on. He knew that you were a creator, and he wanted to in, put in the mind of his son, son, you're a creator. And so the closest that he could give you to understanding your creative power is your God. Right. We're creators by our nature. And you said something earlier, and I want to go back to it because I don't want to just scheme over it and people miss it. Neville said whatsoever. Neville did not come up with that term. Neville got that term from scripture. And it says, right. whatsoever you believe when you pray, if you believe that you should have that thing, you should have that thing. And the qualifier is whatsoever. The problem is you talked about being. Most of us never clothe ourselves in being a multimillionaire, a billionaire, a loving husband, health. You know what I'm saying? We yes. talk about it, but we never clothe ourselves in it. Let's talk about that. How did you... Besides, I like to say that you just listen to Neville's talks and all of a sudden that happened. But normally there's a process that one goes through. Was there a process that you entered into to make that shift? Yeah, so to, you said something, and I'm glad you mentioned it. When Neville was to speak, he said something. He said, if you want to be a dancer, be a dancer. If you want to be an engineer. And that led to, when he said it, I figured that you don't you didn't have to be qualified to be whatever you want to be. Right? So me writing this book, I I was I was kind of hesitant writing it because I thought I had I had to qualify to be an author. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I don't I think with with hinders people is they think they have to be qualified to be something. And you can literally start from scratch and be whatever you want to be, positive, negative, indifferent. Literally, the world is literally yours. And I, and sometimes I, I underestimate that statement yeah. because it's so simple, but we complicate it. But to, to piggyback off, to go back to your question, it was, it was a process. Okay. Because when he when he was explaining like if you want to do this, just do it. And it was we so conditioned to to uh, we're so conditioned. A lot of things that people do is taught. Yeah. 
whether it's to react to something, act something, be something. And it, it took me a little time to grasp it. Mm-hmm. So because I had a difficult time to grasp certain concepts, I used the, the technique of um, I remember when. Yeah. Because that was more of a game to me. Mm-hmm. So I also always say, yeah, I remember when I acquired this property. I remember when people said I wasn't a real estate investor. So I used to use it as a game. Yeah. Because sometimes if you don't believe it for yourself, then I used to, what Neville said, sometimes use a friend, like use a friend that you know of saying it back to you in your imagination. So I use that a lot. Because mm-hmm. I had a, it was, when Neville said it, it was, it was mind blowing. And it was so eye opening that it was challenging for me to, start from me so i had to use my imagination to act like people are talking to me like i am that already absolutely and i so i had to use it as a game gotcha. by trial and error sometimes i failed sometimes i didn't but that that was my process i love something that you just said and i know that it just kind of flowed out and you said listen i used it as a game out of trial and error I talk to so many coaching clients and what they're always doing is trying to perfect before they do the first video, trying to perfect before they do the first business deal. They try to get everything perfect, but the way that you get everything perfect is that last phrase you use, trial and error. One of my uh, coaching clients who's an actor, he and I we were talking and, you know, he was saying, you know, I would love to get out and start doing videos and blah, blah, blah. And I told him, I said, listen, just start doing videos. At first, the videos are going to suck. They're going to suck. You know, <laughs> that's just by virtue of doing, you write your first book, you know, you're going to learn some things from it. You, you you do your first real estate purchase. You learn something from it. You did your second one. You learned something else from it. You did your third. Every time the trial and error We don't realize that the trial and error is how we perfect it. So many people are waiting to be perfect, as it were, before they take action. That doesn't sound like that was your dilemma. You and I have talked, and I know that sometimes you'll just take action as a game to see where it goes. I I was amazed one time we were talking, and you were talking about going into schools. And I said, well, many people, when they think about approaching people, they worry about hearing the word no. And you said, no doesn't concern me. Let's talk about that. The more no's you get, it's like you're getting closer to one yes. Right? So I just see it as I'm going to approach it. Because if you if, if you love something and you have fun doing it, yeah. the no really is like, water to a duck's back. It really doesn't affect you like that. It may sting a little bit depending on how bad you want it or whatever the case may be, depending on the person. But I just see it as like, I'm. it's okay. Really, like it really is okay. And if you want something bad enough, then no, really, it it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So me approaching schools, I knew that either they're not ready yet or they just don't see it. And I just keep I keep going. And the only reason why I have this attitude now, because I had business prior to this and I failed so miserably. I hit rock bottom to the core. And it stung so much that anything happened moving forward and any endeavor that I chose to think, um, choose to do, anything after that, it didn't even hurt anymore. So, yeah, that was my experience. It's funny that you say that because when I study the lives of multi-millionaires, billionaires, we find that many of them have failed in multiple dozens of businesses. And so, but we as a society, we believe that so-called failure or being told no, we take it as personal rejection and not as as you stated, the next opportunity. You said that those no's take you to your yes. 
And if we looked at no's differently, and no may mean that the way that I'm presenting something needs to be modified. My offer needs to change. Mm -hmm. No sometimes tells us that what it is that I'm doing may need a slight shift. And it's an indicator. Nobody gets to a stop sign and takes it as rejection or a stoplight and takes it as a, a rejection or a detour sign and takes it as a rejection. And really, in all actuality, that's all no is. If the person, if we have in our mind's eye that I'm going to do real estate investment, that I'm going to travel the world and teach these principles in my case, then no's only a ladder to get me there. But what I learned from the ladder is invaluable. And I think that you would agree what you've learned from your no's are sometimes mm -hmm. more valuable than what you receive from your yes. A hundred percent. I think people fail to realize that in that journey, the no's and the failures, quote unquote failures, or uh, hitting, you know, hitting your face to the ground metaphorically, that is part of the journey. And it makes it so much, it's so, it's like a paradox because if you don't stumble, if you will, it's not, the journey doesn't seem as worth it. Yeah. It's like, a, it's so, it's, it's interesting. So even when you said, you know, when people say no, it's just a way of reflection. You like, listen, you probably need to modify how you approach it. Mm -hmm. Like when I talk, to, when I teach, when I go to these workshops and I teach the youth, when I'm explaining it, they look at, they look at me like, mm, Mark, I don't get it. And I said, listen, please let me know that you don't get it so I can get better explaining it at a better level. Yeah. Because when you don't get it, I get better. And the more I say it, they are, I always say, like, listen, mistakes are great. As long as you learn from it, mistakes are great. And I always tell them, like, listen, if you don't understand what I'm saying, let me know. Because you're actually helping me get better so you can learn better. And so the youth, the youth are a huge indicator of if I'm explaining it right, if you're on the right track, if you need some work on and you need more polishing, things of that nature. You said something. You said, listen, when you're talking to the youth, and you look in their face and you say, they're not getting it. To let you know that they don't get it. Being in elementary school, and see, I was one of those kids that was that was labeled educationally challenged. For me to say that I didn't get it was an indicator that I feel like I was stupid. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that you've given the youth permission to say this doesn't make sense. But as a result, you're able to take something and improve upon it. And we're in a society that we come from a place that I know that. Now, the second we say that I know that, we turn off learning, and most people don't realize that. But when we're open to learning, even from children, then we vastly enhance our learning. Have you found that to be the case in your interaction with young folks? Tenfold, 100,000%. <laughs> every, every time I go because I'm thinking I'm getting better and then I come to find out you can get better <laughs> so it, yeah the kids will let you know like Mr. Marcus uh, I don't get it yeah. or when I see them bored like I gotta I gotta now again what I'm teaching is not for everybody and yeah. I understand that yeah. so you will have some people that just might zone out and things of that nature but for the people who are locked in and zoned in with you, yeah. those that's my focus. Yeah. Right. And I just just learn to get better. Like earlier today, I had a session and some of the things they just was not getting. And I said, okay, who does not understand? You'd be surprised. Majority of them raised their hand. So I'm like, how and I had to write it on the board and I had fun doing it. It wasn't like a a stress factor or uh a, uh, like an obligation and, and, and burdensome. It was like, okay, how can I get better? Yeah. And that's how I see it. I like something, and I want people to, for those who are doing business, 
you said something. You said, listen, this information isn't for everybody. Often I'll inquire with a coaching client, who's your client? And they say, everybody can benefit from this. And you said something. You said, listen, this ain't for everybody. So, of course, I know that I'm going to lose somebody. But my goal, and the same with Mr. Lindo and I, our goal is for those people that get it. There's yeah. people that get on, you know, our channel and they say, you know, croc, you know, whatever they, they say about, <laughs> you know, what it is that we're teaching. And yeah. I realize I don't spend a lot of time with them because the message isn't for them yet. But the message is for those who can receive what's being taught. And what I realize is that our goal is to lay out a foundation that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people can come and listen to our talks and still find the tools being beneficial. And I think that that's the seed that you're planting. We think that we're talking about solely real estate investment, for example, but the children are learning how to conduct business. They're learning how money flows, how to create money. And it's wonderful because, see, I didn't learn that in school. We did mathematics and things like that, but nobody was teaching us entrepreneurship. So I applaud those schools that are welcoming you into their schools to talk about something that seems to be, even for adults, this might as well be trigonometry, geometry, you know, mm -hmm. calculus for most of us as adults. It's like somebody filing their taxes at a higher level. Uh -huh. And you've simplified real estate investment so much so that even a fifth grader can understand it. <laughs> uh, touche. <laughs> touche, touche. <laughs> touche. So I want to look at... Uh, you talked about something in your book, and I want to talk about it. Let's talk about the inner economy. What does so, that mean? Yeah. Inner economy is, so there's the economy, the world, the country you live in, which is secondary. Mm -hmm. The inner economy is how you see the world from within. So, for example, when people say, oh, there's a recession, money's dried up, this and that. Depending on who you ask, some people are going to be affected by that because what they see as a fact, right. and then there's other people who's making even twice, double, ten times more money when there's a recession Absolutely. because they understand that no matter what happens in the economy, that they're always going to generate income because how they feel within. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like there's a recession coming and you're going to lose your job, then guess what? That's going to happen. If you feel like a, a, a recession is coming and this is a, uh, an amazing opportunity for you to come up, then it will happen. But you definitely got to get into the right mindset to um, get into that, that zone, that state, that no matter what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop you, doesn't stop your money from flowing to you. And I think, yeah, in the economy, is like, let's say, for example, someone owes you money, mm -hmm. right? On one side of the spectrum, some people are going to say, well, I'm broke because such and such owe me money. Yeah. On the flip side, on the person who, how they view money on an internal level, they're going to say, okay, yeah, that person owes you money, but it's not going to stop more money from coming in. So I think it goes back to your inner economy is which, how you think about yourself here first, and it reflects on your outer. I like that. And I think that it's relevant, especially when we're talking about the law of assumption. A lot of us, you know, because of how we've been raised, how we've been brought up, especially around the subject matter of money, we have all these negative money stories that we tell ourselves. And so we'll see a flash on the news that says that the economy has, you know, went down five points, you know, that now we're kind of in a uh, mini recession and people start operating from that mindset. 
as opposed to what you just stated, that you determine the mindset and it determines your outset. Now, when you're talking to young folks, do you explain to them the importance of the right attitude? Because that's what we're really talking about. So how do you help young folks, especially they may be coming from an impoverished home, for example? Yeah, so, so, yeah. So, so how I go about that is when it comes to, because especially the youth, I love to talk to them about money because it's relatable. Mm -hmm. It's easy to count. Everybody can relate to it. So I let them know that money is an energy, mm -hmm. right? And if you talk bad or down about money, you shoot it away from you. Yeah. And if you're indifferent about it, and I, I was good at this, being indifferent about it, like, mm, you're going to pay me this? Okay, it don't matter. When you have that attitude, it does, no one, the money's not going to attract, it's not going to come to you. That's like if you if you like somebody and they say, hey, you want to go on a date? Uh, I mean, uh, they're not going to feel like you, you, you want them, yeah. right? So yeah. when it comes to money, it's an energy. And like Rev Ike, he, he talks about money, it's like a woman. If you give them compliments or you, you shower them with just compliments and just positivity, then more of it will come to you. Right. So it's not. So I give them those examples and I say, listen, next week when I see you, just have a, a, a change of mindset about money. Right. Instead of saying, oh, that's too expensive or oh, I can't afford that. Change and say, how can I afford that? Because yeah. soon as you say I can, it shuts your mind down and you just stop thinking. Yeah. So I, I tell them to, you know, choose different words to come out their mouth. Mm -hmm. Or say I'm saying I can't, or let alone, let's just say they're too shy to even speak about it. Yeah. I said, just observe people. Just observe them. Whoever saying, whoever is talking, okay, sorry. Whoever is talking negative about money, just look at them, observe them. See where they're at mentally, and then look at people who talks high about money, now oh, positive about money. Mm -hmm. And just look how they move, look how they walk, look how they talk. Now, as far as whether they're positive people or negative people, that's besides the point. Mm -hmm. But as far as money is concerned, Absolutely. Absolutely. just look at how things flow for them. And I, and both, the best example I could give these youth is when I talk, when I talk about drug dealers who go to jail. Because yeah. a lot of them, I, I, I say drug dealers because a lot of drug dealers in their environment, that's all they see. Yeah. So, I have to, so I have to bring that up. But I say, listen, have you guys ever seen a drug dealer? They get, you know, they go to jail. As soon as they come out, within a short period of time, they back up again financially. Whether they're doing something positive or negative, that's their consciousness of how they feel about money. And there's people who've been in jail for X amount of years, they come out and they still have a problem with money. So I give those examples and analogies for them to get it, to catch their attention. And that's, how, that's what I use to help them shift their mindset about money. And we do a game, too. Like, yeah. I say, listen, imagine you, uh, imagine you want to receive $100 within, the, within, this, within a week. Mm -hmm. And I give them examples of what would be the best example for you to receive it. And actually, I've had three, three, three uh, members come back to me and said they received either $100 mm -hmm. or they, they climbed the ladder, the ladder access. <laughs> so I've done that. You know, it's funny, even in mentioning um, the drug dealers, when we think about drug dealers, especially when we look at our society, we look at, you know, crime and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what we fail to recognize, and I've watched biographies on some of these people, some of these people had the greatest business minds. Now, mm -hmm. unfortunately, they delved into something that was illegal, but so did Kennedy. Kennedy's family made their fortune out of alcohol, which was the drug dealing of prohibition. And mm -hmm. I'm not glamorizing the business, but what I'm saying is Joseph Kennedy had a brilliant business mind. Many of these drug dealers, and it goes back to the principle, no matter what the business is, to him who has, more shall be given. 
And what we're talking about, the having in consciousness, when that person has the business mind says, I know how to make money. Now, the truth of the matter is that drug dealer can go into car sales. They can mm -hmm. go into real estate. They can apply the same principles that they use to sell the commodity of drugs. And pharmaceutical companies do it all the time. But again, we legalize that. Right, There's right. really no difference. Uh, right. It's still something that's harming the body. But once you start talking to these individuals, and like I said, I've watched a number of interviews on these individuals. They had brilliant business minds. And I was talking to a person at the store the other day, and he was talking about a person that used to work at his store. He had a photograph, photographic memory. And so when somebody would punch their key in, he would remember all these keys and he would get the credit cards and he was using the credit cards in the store. Instead of throwing him in jail, they had him pay all the money back. But he was saying this guy was so smart. Why wouldn't he use that intelligence towards something else? And this is the point that we're talking about. Once you start utilizing this thing called mind, Neville called imagination God. When you yeah. begin utilizing your imagination, in any direction, good, bad, or indifferent, and you talk about <laughs> even being indifferent, it's going to bring about a harvest. Let's talk about, before we wind it down, the book. How can people get the book? Well, there's two ways they can get the book. Uh, one of them is on Amazon. Okay. See the title right there. It's amazing. Even the fifth grade is not a real, that's the real estate. I know it's a long title, but... That's one way. And the next way is uh, my website. It's Ascension, A-S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N-M-G-N-T dot com. The link is below the description. Absolutely. And uh, there's books and we do have merch. So if you have, if you buy the hoodie, you get the book for free. But I do have a shirt as well. So if you buy the shirt, you also get the book for free. Okay. So as Mark has stated, we will have the links and the uh, information in the comments below. And we'll also have uh, the link uh, for his information pinned in the comments. So you want to look for it. What I find sometimes is you're not able to grab that pin link in the comments. So you will be able to, if not, you can still get the link down below in the comments. So Marcus, uh, as we're winding down, what final words, would, what would you want them to take away from this? One thing I would like the viewers to take away is to really be specific and decisive in regards to what you want. It may not be real estate. It may be another business. But whatever you decide, it has to be specific and you have to make a decision. And if you really want to make it fun, mm. right, I think you should try it. It's fun. Like once you understand how to have fun with this, using your imagination, imagining bigger, dreaming bigger, thinking bigger. And if you don't, if you are apprehensive of thinking big, start with something small. You can get to the point where if you have a job and you have an issue with your, your boss or whatever, and you want them to say something nice to you, imagine them saying something nice to you. Of course, you have to do something for that to happen. <laughs> Right? But nonetheless, at times, you'd be surprised. They might say, hey, you look at nice today. Just something really small just to test it out. And once that becomes once that becomes your reality, they start picking and choosing what will be your next thing to bring it to fruition. Yeah. And so I think, it, I think once you learn to have fun with it, then you'll realize how much time you wasted in the past, and now you have to look forward. And because obviously you didn't know, but now that you know, I think you should just give it a shot. Just use your imagination, have it in a fun way. And if you want to do it in real estate, you can definitely reach out to me. But if it's, if, but if it's for any other business, you can still pick up some gems from the book and apply it to whatever endeavor you choose to do. And um, just keep listening to Neville and other yeah. uh, people like Neville, Joseph Murphy, Rev Ike. Uh, there's so many names, but you got to find out what works for you, sure. narrow it down, and stick with it, and go from there. I had the pleasure of going through this book 
And let me say this. It may be called real estate investment, but the truth of the matter is Marcus gives a lot of insight on business. So the truth of the matter is no matter what your business is, you're going to be able, yes, it's primary focus is on real estate, but the concepts is really on how to conduct good business. It's a good book for business. It's like Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, Think and Grow Rich. It's one of those books that goes deeper than what the title suggests. And like I said, it may be talking about real estate, but what he's talking about and utilizing the tools of Neville will take you far beyond the area of real estate. So don't look at it and say, well, I'm not interested in real estate investment and shut your mind off. As listening to Marcus in this interview, you realize that his depth is far deeper than simply real estate investment. And what I know about Marcus is that is not his only business. And we've talked about other business ventures that he's involved in. My point to you is don't write the book off because you're simply looking at it from a standpoint of real estate investment. It goes much deeper than that. So can they also reach you then through that same website, uh, the Ascension website? Or do you have a personal uh, website for Marcus Rogers? Or how do they get a hold of you? Thank you for that. Um, well, they can, when they go on my website, mm -hmm. there is a contact us link. Okay. And they can contact me there or my email is info at ascensionmgnt.com. It'll be in the link as well. Okay. And just to, I would like to also point out that this book, it is mostly for beginners, mm -hmm. basic information. Right now, even if whoever whoever's viewing this video, if you're an expert in it, that's fantastic. You can also pass it to people who want to learn about it. Mm -hmm. But it's mostly for basic information, and it's up to the reader to do their own their own due diligence and take it to the next level on their own accord. Yeah. So I just wanted to point that out. And I'm glad that you mentioned that. But you know, the funny thing is, even when we're talking about the principles of Neville. Neville was giving us foundational tools, and it's up to each person as you've implemented many of these tools in your own business. Likewise, with the individual, you take on this book on real estate investment at a basic level. But like I said, when you begin applying the principles, it's going to transcend real estate investment, and you're going to be able to apply the principles that he talks about, even as these young people do in every and certainly other aspects of their life. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you, sir, and I uh, look forward to future talks. And listener, you're going to take a great deal from this. So like I said, I'll have the links below so that you can access the book. And for those who are interested in accessing markets concerning real estate or possible coaching uh, towards real estate or some other venture or whatever, uh, you'll have his links. So, sir, like I said, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you, sir. You too.